All right, let's, uh, let's get into the preaching. Like tonight I want to uh, preach about uh, singing. So the title of my sermon is uh, Singing and Making Melody. Um, if you've been keeping up with the, the YouTube channel, I've been sort of uploading a, a, a few um, hymns that I've been recording just of myself singing. That way, uh, I'm going to try and do that for all the hymns that we sing. That way you have a single playlist in alphabetical order. If you're not familiar with the songs, you can use that playlist and just hear the melody, get familiar with the songs, and then you can participate more in the singing at church. So I'm just working through those as a little project myself as well and just um, loading them all onto the YouTube channel. So if you're not subscribed on the YouTube channel, you can subscribe and, um, and, and listen to those um, to, to get used to the hymns. So we'll just start in Ephesians 5.19 because this is where I get the title of the sermon from. And there's really not that many passages in the New Testament about singing, but um, this is really where it's at. It says here in Ephesians 5.19, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, in the churches that I've been in in the past, I haven't really gone to that many churches. Like I've visited a few, but in terms of churches that I've been heavily involved in, there was always a running joke that the soul winners in the church, like those that were like in evangelism, they were like not the singers. And you'd always have like the people in the choir, that, that's where they spent their time, like Sunday afternoon, you know, they'd had their choir practice and they'd be singing their specials on Sunday morning. But then the soul winners, they, on Sunday afternoon, they're, they're going out soul winning. So you'd always have like this kind of divide in these churches where you have the soul winners and then you have the singers. Um, and it was always a running joke that, you know, if you're good at soul winning, then you're probably not good at singing. <laughs> so it's just like, and the other way around. Now that, that ought not be the case, right? That shouldn't be the case where it's just one or the other, because both are commands. Both are required from us. It's not that we should just be a soul winner or a singer and vice versa, just a singer or a soul winner. As Christians, we should, we should be trying to get to the point where we are soul winners and singers, right? As well as other things, right? There are certain things in the Christian life that are really important and, and singing is one of them, right? Now singing and music, it's, it's a really powerful tool, isn't it? Music is an extremely powerful tool and really what it does is it enhances the, the spiritual effect of words, doesn't it? It enhances the effect of words. That's why you can, you can teach somebody something, but if you put it to song, then people start to memorize it. They start to enjoy it. They start to just unknowingly say it to themselves again and again and again and again. And this is why music is so powerful. This is why God uses music. This is something that God created. God knows the power of music. And this is why we have singing in church. This is why singing is a part of the Christian life. Um, singing is a huge part of Christianity. If you think about it, the largest book in the Bible, the, the book of Psalms, is a, is a book that is 150 chapters, 150 Psalms. And guess what it is? It's a song book, right? People don't know that. Like I know when you read through the Psalms, if you, weren't, if you didn't know what a Psalm was, that's why it says here, singing to yourselves in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I don't believe these are particularly different. I think they're kind of three synonymous things and it's just saying the same thing three times. But, you know, a psalm is a hymn, is a spiritual psalm. That's the way I see it. Some people say, oh, there's actually distinct differences between the three. Um, I wouldn't argue there necessarily, but I think they, they're very, very synonymous. So that's what a psalm is. A psalm, you know, in the Bible, that was the, that was the, the Hebrew songbook, right, that they would sing from, that David would write songs, right? And that's, those songs were so spiritual. They became, they, some of them were scripture. Some of them were inspired by the Holy Ghost, spoken through David and through other psalm writers. So if you think singing and music is a small part of Christianity where you think, well, I don't really need to sing. I don't really need to be a singer. I don't need to be really think about music at all. Um, you, you have got the wrong God, right? Because God, the God of the Bible, he is big on music to the point where the largest book in the Bible is, is a book of songs. Now, when you read through the Psalms, you're kind of thinking, well, these don't sound like songs. Well, it's because they've been translated, right? They've been translated into English. I'm sure if you read them in, in the original Hebrew, if you knew how to read Hebrew, there probably would be some rhyme or reason to it. And it, there, there would probably be, actually be uh, melodies that go along with them. And some people have tried to do that, uh, you know, when they, then they make music. And, and, I, and I love it when people do that. If they can make a song, where it's memorable, it's catchy, and they can put it to the Word of God, that, that is a beautiful thing to do. Unfortunately, I think it's very difficult because the Bible is 
a translation, sometimes the, the verses don't always fit the song as we would recognize a song, you know, when it rhymes, it sort of has a rhythm. Um, and sometimes people try and force it and you can tell sometimes when a scripture song is a bit forced and they're just like trying to ram <laughs> the verses yep. into a song, which, you know, I guess it's all right for, for like maybe a solo, you know, you're listening to it, but they're really hard to sing along with. But when people do, sometimes people can um, come up with songs that quote scripture verbatim and, you know, those are the scriptures that you don't forget. Like if, you've, if you have a song, that, you know, growing up as a Christian or, you know, being in a church for a long time and you, and you hear songs that have scripture, like those are the verses you just don't forget. Like I even remember at a youth camp once where um, in youth camp sometimes there's different themes and... Uh, one, one of the themes was like each group was like a different hymn writer. And one group, they, they, they took one, their hymn writer's song and put it to, to the camp's theme verse or the verse of their group. And I still remember them singing it to that day. It's like, 2 Corinthians 4.18. That's blessed assurance. While we look not at the things which are seen. So they, they were just having fun with it, right? But... In doing that, I, I've not forgotten that verse till this day just because they put it to that song. Um, so that's, that's the power of music, right? And, 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 you know, if you think of the, the book of Psalms, you, know, you read through the book of Psalms, like these are not children's books. I mean, you know, book of Psalms is it, for a new Christian, it's a hard book to read. Why? Because it's, it's full of doctrine. It's full of praise to God. It's got stories in there, stories that remind them of what the children of Israel, remind them of God, sing about salvation, sing about God's mercy. I mean, so many topics are covered in Psalms. So it gives you a good idea of what God expects from Christian music, right? And what music is meant to, to do. Now, we don't want to be naive about music in the sense that because music is such a powerful tool, you know who else wants to use it? Satan wants to use it, right? Satan also is a musical creature. Uh, and if we look at Ezekiel 8, verse 11, we, uh, we read, uh, sorry, Ezekiel 28, sorry, uh, Ezekiel 8, uh, verse 11, we get a bit of insight into Satan, right? This is called, talking about a king, but we know it's talking about Satan because this king obviously wasn't in Eden. It says here, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Some insight into Satan, who he is. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper. He's a very beautiful creature. The sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So we see a description of Satan. He's got musical instruments. He's a musical creature. Satan knows how to sing. He knows what makes the flesh tick. He knows how to use me. And this is why when, you know, and I'm not really into this sort of stuff, but, you know, you see, you know, people, they, they, they research into the backgrounds of all these different singers. And a lot of them, they have this spiritual inspiration, right? Where they say that sometimes they just overcome and they just, they don't know where this inspiration comes from because oftentimes it's satanic. Right? If, they're, if they're a cultic or they're worshipping Satan or they've got some sort of voodoo, you know, spiritual sort of religion where they're tapping into some unknown power, it's probably sa satanic influence on them, giving them that ability. Why does Satan want to give them that ability? So that they can teach the world their doctrine. They can teach the world their music. And then you, as, you know, as, as a Christian, don't, don't, you know, don't even think about these things. You go and listen to that music and you're just filling your heart and your mind with doctrines of devils. So don't be naive about the power of music. This is the reason why God created it, why to teach truth, but then Satan then uses music in order to teach his lies. That's why it's really, in, we really have to be aware of the sort of music we listen to. And people just think that they can naively just listen to worldly music you know, music from the world, from people that hate God, the people that sing about fornication and materialism and all these things, and not be affected. I mean, are we really so ignorant to think that we can just listen to these songs day in, day out, and not be affected by the philosophy that is in that music? Of course not. I mean, I still remember lyrics from R&B music 
decades ago, when I used to go clubbing and all that stuff, and I'll, I'll just be doing, and then this song would just randomly pop in my head, and it's the most disgusting, wicked song, talking about fornication and adultery and all this garbage, and it's still in my head. Like, I still, to this day, sometimes it just pops into my head, and I'll find myself singing along to it, and I'm just like, what the hell am I doing? I'm singing this crap, you know what I mean? This stuff that I don't, I don't want anything to do with. So, that's how powerful it is. Now, sometimes, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we are naive about the power, power that worldliness has on us. You know, the worldly music, the worldly movies, worldly friends, right? Worldly friends as well. Like, we, we you know, you see, like, worldly Christians, right? And you can, you can spot them a mile away, worldly Christians, right? And, you know, you just think, like, you know, why, is, why are these Christians so worldly? Well, you find out it's because they're listening to worldly music. You know, they've got worldly friends. They're watching all the worldly movies and you're just like, hey, ding, there's no, there's no secret to why you're so worldly because you're, you're listening to the world stuff all the time. And this is why sometimes teenagers as well, they get this warped view of love and romance. Yeah. Why are they getting this warped view on love and romance? Because they're listening to all this worldly music all the time that's singing about, you know, it's, not, it's fake. You know what I mean? Like if there's a guy or a girl... You know, for those of you that are looking for people to get married to, there's a guy or a girl that's trying to get you to fornicate, trying to get you to disobey your parents, getting you out of church. I mean, that's not love. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is a joke. Like, you think this guy, like, oh, yeah, hey, this guy loves me so much, or this girl loves me so much because they want to spend time with me and they want to fornicate with me. <sighs> what, what a joke, all right? Like, these guys, like, I, I just can't believe anybody falls for that sort of stuff when people just go, and I mean, you know why you fall for it? Because you're listening to the worldly music. You're listening to the, you're watching the worldly movies. You're not getting your, uh, your philosophy on what love should be from the Word of God, how love is. You know, and then we get this Hollywood-style, unrealistic expectation of marriage. And obviously, it is, it is in differing degrees. Some people just go way off the deep end where they're just like, you know, they just got this fairy tale thing. But even to, to a lesser degree, you know, like sometimes women just get this, this crazy idea that, you know, that, that, that their husband, it's just like, like they've never loved, they've never like found anybody else attractive ever before. Like sometimes you, you, you talk to some ladies, right? And then they, they find out that, that their husband would dare even lust after another woman, right? Which is obviously wrong. But this is just what men do. But some women, they're so distraught when they find out about this it's because they just, they just think like, like, you know, in Hollywood, that it's just, oh, this is, you know, this is all there is, I'm just diving. And obviously that is what men should be striving for. But my point is, it's about having realistic expectations, coming back to reality. Um, now let's go to 2 Corinthians. Sorry, I was going to be in a bit of a tangent there. 2 Corinthians 7.1. Look what the Bible tells us here. We don't want to have this warped view on things, worldliness. Um, but the Bible says here in 2 Corinthians 7, uh, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So you see here, it's not only that we are to be clean physically in terms of fornication and whatnot, but we want to be clean spiritually as well. We want to clean ourselves from spiritual filthiness. And where does that come from? That comes from the words and the music and the things that we listen to. So what do I recommend? You know, if, if you're listening to worldly music, you're watching worldly movies and whatnot, you've got to change the playlist. You know, like if you have uh, all of us back in the day, you know, had all the R&B and all that music on our computer, on our phones, you know, maybe you, you downloaded a bunch of Netflix movies and they're on your computer, and they're on your phone, change it up, change, get rid of them and change it with something that is actually worth watching. You know, you can replace your music. Now, that doesn't mean you have to replace it with my singing. I'm not saying you replace it with my singing, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, my, my YouTube, you know, that I've made it so that you can replace it with that. No, that's just to help you learn the songs. I'm saying there's a lot of awesome Christian music out there. If you want to listen to music, just change it for something that glorifies God. You know, it's like when I, you know, when I do those videos, you see that that's music that I've just collected over the years. And I've, got, I've kind of got enough that we can sort of play it in the house. And, and you know, if we want some music that's not silent, at least it's music that's glorifying to God. It's praising Jesus. It's teaching right doctrine and all that sort of stuff. And that stuff's easy to find, you know. If you, and if you're wondering what sort of uh, groups that there are, you know, I really like Soundforth. I like The Wilds. 
Um, and there are other groups like that, that they, they make awesome music. Uh, that, that if you really want to listen to music, you know, which, which I recommend, if you're going to listen to music, listen to Christian music. Um, you know, replace your music and, and stuff with sermons. Or even podcasts, you know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you don't necessarily want to listen to sermon, I mean, why don't you put on a podcast instead when you're driving in the car, rather than listening to worldly music, put on some sort of podcast, learn something, you know, get some more knowledge uh, and hymns and whatnot. Get rid of that stuff because don't be naive about how that stuff affects you. Look what the Bible says here in Luke 6.45. It says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil, for of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So you see here that what you fill your heart with is what's going to come out. And the more you fill your heart with the world's music, Satan's doctrine, things like that, that's what's going to come out. And that's why people swear all the time. You know, some people, it's just F this, S this, F that, oh, F this, you know, oh, F you, what not. Well, the reason why they talk like that, I mean, they didn't learn that from the Bible. Oh, you, didn't le you didn't learn to talk like that hanging around with Christians. No, the, the, way, the reason why people talk like that is because they learned it from the world, right? They learned it from Hollywood. They learned it from these gangster rappers that think they're cool, and you think you're cool copying them. Well, newsflash, guys, you're not cool copying Hollywood, all right? So garbage in, garbage out. If you feed garbage into your heart, you fill your heart with garbage, that's what's going to come out. So be, take heed to that. And don't, um, uh, don't be naive about the power of music to influence you and, and particularly the words that come across, you know. Replace that. You know, music is enjoyable. I get it, right? Music is a really enjoyable thing. I enjoy music too. I love listening to music. You know, you listen to a song and sometimes you're just like, oh man, this is like so awesome, this song, you're listening to it. But you know what makes a song even better? when you realize that lyrics are actually praising God rather than blaspheming God. That's what makes music even... Because, you know, there was music back in the day that I thought was so good. Now when I listen to the lyrics, I'm like, that's disgusting. I don't want anything to do with that. But now you can listen to music. If you listen to music that's glorifying to God, you not only get the awesome feeling of listening to awesome music, but you also know that God is pleased with what you're listening to. And in your heart, you're also singing and making medley. You're singing along with that song. So let's go to Ephesians, uh, back to Ephesians 5, and just uh, talk about We'll just uh, look at the two passages in particular <clears throat> in the New Testament talking about uh, singing and uh, making melody in your heart. So we already read Ephesians 5, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the parallel passage is in Colossians 3.16, it says here, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So I just want to focus on three things in these passages and just talk a bit about, I already talked about the power and influence of music, just wanted to touch on that a bit. Um, and now I want to talk to you more about just the practical side of singing and sort of give you some direction on, you know, what should you be thinking about when you sing? What's the purpose of singing and, and things like that? So the first thing you'll see, the first of the three that you'll see in here, it says, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And again here in Ephesians 5, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So first and foremost, it's for God, right? We sing for God, to God. Now, singing, it's not, it's, it's singing is a command, right? It's not just a gift yeah. in the sense that it's not just something that only talented people that know how to sing ought to sing. We are commanded in the Bible to speak to ourselves in Psalms and spiritual songs, to sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. So you have to think about this and consider this. If you're not a singer, then you're just sinning more. I would say people, if you're not singing, you're sinning, right? So, because singing, it's a command. It's not just a gift. Because somebody might just say something like, ah, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm just not the singing type. Yeah. Have you ever heard people say that? They say things like, you know, I know we have to sing in church. I know, I know I'm, I'm meant to be, you know, I know the Bible talks about singing, but I'm just not the singing type. 
But see, what if somebody said to you, what if somebody said to you, well, I'm just not the loving type. I just, I just don't, I, you know, I, know, I always, always love stuff in the Bible. I'm just not the loving type. What, that, what that's really saying is, somebody's saying, I'm not the obedient type, yeah. right? Because there are commandments in the Bible that we have to do. It's not just for the people that are talented. It's for everyone, right? So God has commanded us to sing. So even if you're not the singing type, you need to strive to become the singing type. You know, if you're not that good at singing, you need to strive to become better at singing for God, right? It's the same. If you're not the reading type, you need to strive to become a reader to read the Word of God. If you're not the social type, you need to strive to become more social, right? So that you can get to know your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's everything like that. If you're not the bold type, if you're not the speed, it's all these things. We have to grow. In our, this is what it means to grow in your faith. It's because you weren't that type before right when you weren't saved when you were a baby christian you didn't start at that type growing is now you're starting to become that type right you're starting to become the singing type um, and we just obviously just focus on singing now so because it's a commandment you ought to strive to improve at singing right so a couple of things is you know it's like when you sing as well you know one thing we should try and do is we try and sing in tune you know we try to mimic what we hear Right? You hear the tune, you try and sing along with the tune. Um, try and sing loud. Sing up loud so that you're, you know, you're trying to improve the, the volume of your singing as well. Now, your voice singing, it's a tool, isn't it? Your voice is a tool. And you know what happens with a tool? The more you use it, the better you get at it. Yeah. You know, maybe you hear me singing now and you just think, oh man, Victor just makes song leading look so easy. You know, Victor's just, you know, he's a talented singer. He knows how to hold the tune. Do you know that I was not always a good singer? You know, like, I didn't know, like, I would be shy to sing as well. You know, I, I had to learn music. I had to learn how to conduct. I had to get, you know, more confident singing in front of a crowd. I had to get more confident singing in church. Like, when I, when I first went to church, did you think I just started singing like this? Now, I've been going to church for a really long time learning how to sing you know i went to i went to the see i tried to break that paradigm of soul winner not a singer so i like i was very heavily involved in the evangelism at my first church and i also joined the choir because i was like hey i'm going to join the choir because you know all the soul winners they don't go to choir practice i'm going to do both right so i joined the choir and you know the choir they, they would do the you know the different singing exercises like me 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 you know those sort of things tell you to sing from your diaphragm you know don't sing from your throat you know, trying to, trying to project your voice, how you breathe so that you can sing for a long time. You know, just things like that, just so that I could try and get better at singing, try and make my singing sound a little better. And I think it has improved over time. I remember, my, maybe, my, maybe, maybe I'm just hearing myself different, but I, before I used to think I was very nasal, but now I'm trying to sing a bit more from the, from the gut. So my point is, the more you sing, the better you get at it. Yeah, you might not be good at singing now, but if you keep on singing and you keep on singing, you sing, you sing, you sing, you'll eventually get better. As long as you are striving to get better. If you don't try and get better, yeah, you won't get better. So practice makes perfect. Um, let's go to Hebrews uh, 2. Because we're focusing on you know, singing to the Lord, the fact that it's a command. Um, but also the fact that we're singing to Him. Um, the Bible says here in uh, uh, sorry, Hebrews, I'm going to go to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 13, 15. Where did I see 2? Hebrews 13, 15, it says here, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Isn't that interesting that, that God in Hebrews likens our praise to him, our singing to him continually, like the Old Testament sacrifices, like literally bringing something to the temple, sacrificing it to an altar, burning it, you know, that, that being pleasing to God. God is saying, hey, when you sing to me, that's like a sacrifice to him, the fruit of our lips, giving it over to him, even giving thanks to his name. Now, obviously, it's not only just singing, right? So we have singing, you have just giving thanks, just praising God for things and being grateful for the things that God does for you. But we're focusing on singing today. So one, another thing I want you to think about when you sing, not just in your personal life, but even in church, Remember, we're talking about singing to the Lord, right? So we're singing for the Lord because we're, we're commanded by God to sing, but you're singing to the Lord. So I think you ought to do that consciously, right? When you're singing, are you singing to other people? Yes, as well. 
but in your heart are you singing to god are you singing the music are you not just saying the words and saying the tunes and just going through the motions or when you sing the words in church or you sing the words to him are you actually thinking about a god in heaven that is actually listening to your words and is actually pleased with the fact that your mouth is praising the lord that's what i think about like i think about when i sing jesus is listening to me sing i want to be pleased with my singing and it, and it encourages me to sing more, right? Because I know God is listening, listening to me. So God likes it. And you want to know that God is pleased, you know, hearing you sing to him and about him. And the Bible says here, sacrifice of praise to God continually. So it's not just, you know, you come to church once a week for two hours, you know, you sing a couple of songs and that's your singing. No, God wants you singing all the time, singing to him all the time, right? singing to him in your personal life too, not just with the church, but continually. And one, one thing I can uh, uh, recommend to you is, is to sing continually. Like we were talking about before, if you actually get some Christian music or you listen to Christian music and you're in the habit of listening to that instead of your worldly music, then you will sing to God more often, right? Because think about it, you listen to your worldly music, you start singing that worldly music, just out of habit, right? Because that's what you're used to listening to. You, know, you start, you know, you probably do that too, right? Where you just start, you know, just singing something when you're doing something or you're in the shower, right? You just start singing something. Well, if you want to sing praises to God in a song that's pleasing to Him, then you should listen to that music more, right? You listen to that music more, you get to know the hymns. Then when you're in the shower and you're going to do your number, right now you're going to sing something that's actually pleasing to god rather than just singing whatever you've watched on tv or whatever you watched you know, you know some some car, some uh, uh movie soundtrack or something like that so if you listen to them regularly you'll end up singing them regularly right because those are the songs that are going to be in your heart so that's what's going to come out so that's the first point first point here when we looked at these two passages is we are singing to the lord Right? Singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord, for the Lord. It's a commandment, it's not just a gift. Now the second point, <clears throat> I want to show you here, we'll go back to Ephesians 5, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Um, Colossians says here, so when it talks about the singing, speaking to yourselves, what are we speaking? It says here, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. So we see here in Ephesians, it says, speaking to yourselves. In Colossians, the parallel passage, it says we're teaching and admonishing one another. And that's one of the purposes of singing, right? One of the purposes of music is that we are to edify. We're to teach and admonish. So not only do we teach what to do, but we also admonish, right? Teach what not to do. Right? So we're being corrected by music, but we're also being exhorted to do what is right. And the point here is, is that the doctrine in music, it matters. Right? So that's why even when I choose hymns, I try to choose hymns that are doctrinally sound, because I don't want you guys to be singing doctrinally unsound songs, and also my children, I don't want them to learn doctrinally unsound songs too. So that's why if there's any hymns that don't have sound doctrine, like I want to know, because I, you know, sometimes I'm just so used to singing them as well, that I, I just sing them and not really thinking about those words. But sometimes we sing songs that are not right. So the doctrine definitely matters and obviously we sing about all sorts of doctrines right Do you know praising god you know songs that remind us of the cross you know redeemed the old rugged cross um you know songs about living right right i am resolved um you know we'll work till jesus comes you know we sing songs about soul winning you know bring them in um are you sowing the seed of the kingdom but you know there are some songs with wrong doctrine too right and and you know one of them is like for example victory in jesus victory in jesus has a phrase in there that says you know and i repented of my sin and won the victory talking about salvation so i'm not saying that people don't sing that song i'm saying that if they sing it they ought to just change those words just change the words to something that is doctrinally sound so that you can sing that tune you can sing that song with words that are doctrinally sound as well um, you know, there are other passages, other uh, songs I've changed as well that I won't really go into. But the point being, when we sing songs, we want to think about what is actually being taught in that song. Because like we talked about in the beginning, it makes a difference um, because, the, because the music is really going to have a big effect on uh, how we retain those words and how we consider those words. So 
you really want to consider the words when you sing a song. Now, not just like we talked about singing to the Lord and singing consciously to the Lord, but also when you sing a song, think about the words you're actually singing and what they mean, right? Because sometimes it's like when you're reading, you know, sometimes you're reading and you just realize, like, I'm just looking at these words and I have no idea what's actually going on here. That's the same with music, right? It's the same with singing. Sometimes you'll be in church, you know the tune, and you're familiar with the tune, and you're just singing those words, but you're not really thinking about what those words are saying. You ought not to sing that way. The way you should be singing is thinking about what is this song actually teaching us. That's why the doctrine in the song matters, because you're actually learning things from that song. You'll be reminded of spiritual truths. You'll, you'll be taught spiritual truths as well in songs. So sing them, think about what you're singing, think about the words, and you know, sing them with your children as well. If you teach your children to sing the hymns, then they will also learn that same doctrine, right, in, in, in their spiritual life as they grow. Now, the last one I just want to cover is, uh, it says here, you know, uh, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This one says, speaking to yourselves. So, not only are we teaching and admonishing one another, but this is why we do what's called congregational singing. Congregational singing is when all the church sings together. The reason why we do congregational singing is because the Bible says here that we are to speak to ourselves. Yourselves is plural. This is why we sing together, because we are singing to one another exhorting and encouraging each other in the spiritual truths that are being taught in that hymn. So you want to sing both to yourself, like we talked about. You're singing to yourself and learning those things. You're singing to God, but you're also singing to one another. That's why when you come to church, you ought to be singing audibly. We're singing together so that we are fulfilling this command to speak to ourselves or to speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now that means, guys, you've got to come to church early enough to sing those songs, right? Like, you know, Ashton was saying to me, he's like, I don't know, know any other church where people just feel like, you know, they just come like halfway through the meeting and there's like no shame whatsoever. Now, I understand, right? Like people live busy, busy lives and maybe the beginning part is a bit more, a bit more work than the rest of it, right? Because listening to me preach may be a bit more entertaining than you actually coming, singing, reading through the Bible and praying. But, you know, I definitely encourage you guys to be there. You know, if God is important to you, then, you know, the reading of his word ought to be important to you. If God is important to you, I mean, church should be important to you, right? Yeah. Coming on time. Um, you know, if God's important to you, like singing to him ought to be important to you because people that come like halfway through the meeting, they miss out on all the singing. They miss out on all the prayer, right? So you have to come early enough to even be part of the congregational singing. But also when you sing, you want to be heard by others. So you do need to sing up. You know, it's, it's not right to be in church wh while there is singing going on and just sitting there with your mouth shut. You know, that, that, that's a sin according to the Bible, right? Because when you come to church, you ought to be speaking to yourselves in Psalms, hymns, spiritual song. You ought not be coming every week because let's say you say, well, you know, I'm not the singing type. I've already addressed that. But some people will say things like, well, I don't know the song. Yeah, but then, you know, I get it if that's the first time you've heard the song, but if every week you're coming again and again and again and again, we're singing the same few hundred songs again and again and again and again, and every week you're saying, well, I don't know the songs, then there's a problem there, right? You need to learn, learn the songs. You need to try. When we sing it, try singing the hymns. Try singing them. You're, only, you're not going to get better by not singing at all. So this is why we sing to be heard by others. You don't want to just sit there not singing at all. We should all be singing when the singing is going on. Um, and this is why, like, my preference, and I've, I'm not going to preach too long, uh, I'm not going to talk long about why we don't use musical instruments, but this is one of the reasons why I prefer not to use musical instruments in church, because one is I want to hear God's people singing, right? Whereas when we have musical instruments in the congregational singing, a, a lot of churches, that just drowns out the singing, where you can't really hear, you can only hear the people that are amplified, or you can hear their musical instruments. But the congregation, they may as well not even be there, right? Because you can't hear them singing. And in a lot of churches, it doesn't matter if they're there or not because they're just there to put on a show for entertainment. When we sing in church, though, we're not singing for entertainment. Do you know what I mean? Like, this is what you have to understand. Like, when we sing a hymn in church, yes, it can be entertaining. I, I like singing, right? And it gets to the point where I, I don't mind singing. It is entertaining for me. But it, it's, it, the purpose of our singing in church is not entertainment for you guys. It's for you to come and be part of the singing so that you can speak to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs so that you can sing and reflect on the words, 
right, and learn some doctrine, but then also you come and you sing to the Lord, right? And, and other people hear you sing to the Lord so that we are fulfilling this command in the New Testament to speak to ourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So it's not just for entertainment value, right? And this is why I don't really like musical instruments because I feel like it, it, it takes away from the voices, which I feel this is what God wants to hear. God wants to hear us sing. This is why God, uh, you know, I want to hear everyone sing as well. So another thing is, right, if we are teaching and admonishing one another, I believe singing should be sung in a way to be understood, right? And I know, you know, we're not a strong singing church, so it doesn't apply to anybody here, but some people, they sing in a way where you have no idea what they're saying. Have you ever heard that sort of singing? Yeah. Like where they're either it's like an opera style singing yeah. or they're singing with like an accent that's like not even really theirs. And that's fine because some people, you know, they, they, you know, maybe they want to sing with a different accent so the song sounds a little more pleasant to the ears or whatnot. But some people sing so differently that you can't even make out the words. Have you ever heard a song like that where people sing and it's like, what is this person even saying? And, and I speak, and this, it's an English song. You know, it's like it's an English song. I speak English, but I have no idea what you're singing. Whereas... Th that, that doesn't make sense. If you were meant to teach and admonish one another, we need to sing in a way that is understood. And it, obviously it doesn't matter so much with uh, congregational singing, but it does matter a lot when people sing, like say a special, right? When people, I'm not against specials, right? If people want to sing a song and, 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 and exhort the congregation, I don't think that's necessarily a, a wrong thing. But if churches are going to sing specials, right? And they're going to have people sing specials. The people that are singing ought to be told, hey, you need to sing in a way where people understand what you're singing because you're not teaching and admonishing anyone when they can't even hear the words. They can't even make out the words that you're saying. So, you know, like I said, don't, don't just come every week with the same excuse, you know, I don't know this song. Learn the songs, learn the music, listen to them online so that you get used to them. And if there's a song that you like, um, you know, it's in the public domain, we can sing it, right? Uh, that's the reason why we sing a lot of these old songs is because these songs are in the public domain. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it means that they don't have a copyright on them. You don't have to pay a royalty to somebody to sing that song. So this, this may be a shock to you, but it's, you know, when you sing a song and you put words on the screen, that falls under copyright law. You, know, you, can't, you can't necessarily do that. You know, you're actually breaking the laws and something. You have to get permission from people to do that. So that's why I just thought, you know, we just sing the old hymns. You know, they're great, they're full of doctrine and they're public domain so i don't have to pay any licensing fees i don't have to report to them what songs we sing so that they can distribute the funds i just thought that was just one headache that i didn't want to do but you know i'm not against churches that do that like if somebody wanted to say hey these are there's some great songs that we can sing and they wanted to do all the reporting and fulfill all the ccli requirements i'm more than happy to sing you know uh, other christian music but it's just easier when it's not copyrighted that's why um, I get these from PD Hymns. It's called PD Hymns because it's publicdomainhymns.com. So these ones are free to use and replicate and to sing and to copy and to record um, without having to get people's approval and all that sort of stuff. So again, we're, it's congregational singing. So this is why congregational singing as well ought to be predictable rhythms. So just like people sing songs and they sing in a way where you can't make out what they're saying, it's the same when somebody sings in a way that you can't follow along with them. Now, that's okay for a solo or for a special, but if you want to do uh, a congregational song, then you want a song that's easy to follow along with because then everybody can sing along with that. That's why you see a lot of the hymns that we sing, they're easy to follow along with so that we can all sing together. That's why we, there's no rap songs, right? <laughs> congregational songs and whatnot. Um, now, the last point I just want to add in this sort of congregational singing, like I said, I'm not against specials. I'm not against people singing special music items. Specials is, is like an independent Baptist word. It's basically a word that means somebody comes up and sings a solo. Right? They sing a solo or a choir gets up or a group gets up and they actually perform a song to the congregation that is not sung together with them. Now, I'm not against that, like people coming up and singing a song to the congregation in order to teach or admonish and, and, and correct or you know, exhort the congregation to do something. Um, 
and sometimes sometimes it's fitting because sometimes like i said there are some really beautiful songs with great lyrics that can't be sung congregationally so sometimes somebody might want to sing a special song to to uh, sing that to the congregation or, or maybe you want to teach a new song right so sometimes you teach the song first and then you sing it together that might be a reason just for one person to teach the congregation uh, maybe it's just to be a blessing, you know, maybe it's an, an event, special event or something like that and somebody wants to put on a performance where, you know, you don't really have the time for people to learn the song. It's a completely different song that hasn't been learnt before and some people might want to perform that song in order to sing to the congregation. Now, one thing I will say about specials though, because it is a form of teaching, that it should only be men. Right? If it's going to be a solo, then it should be a man. I'm not necessarily against the choir singing and teaching as long as it's led by a man, um, and there can be women in that. But if it's a solo, then I think it should be a man because just like we only have men up here to pray, there's a reason why we only have men pray because prayer is, like Michael said, you can teach things in prayer, the things that you say, and you're addressing the whole congregation. It's the same with singing. When we sing and it's a solo, it's a special, it ought to be men in the church only because men should only be taking up the position to teach and address the whole congregation. So I don't think it's wrong. I do think it should be men. But as I said in the beginning, it's not a replacement for soul winning. You know, that happens in a lot of churches where singing just becomes a replacement for soul winning, where they just spend all their time, you know, preparing for concerts, preparing for performances. And I don't think that's wrong in and of itself. But like I said, it's not a replacement for soul winning. It's not a replacement for doing the work the church ought to be doing. Because you know what soul winners hate the most? And I hate it too. I hate people, like, I don't hate the person themselves. What I hate, what happens is when you have somebody that does absolutely no soul winning, up there singing about soul winning yeah. right because that's the most hypocritical thing somebody goes there oh, i want to go out and reach the world and sing about how much they go soul winning and then at the soul winning hour where are they nowhere right practicing to sing about soul winning so you don't want that to happen in any church right where you know that's why the soul winners should be singers as well and if singers are going to sing they shouldn't sing about soul winning they're not going to go soul winning they ought to just sing about the things that they should be that they are doing all right, so in conclusion, some few closing thoughts. Uh, you know, don't underestimate the power of music, right? If you're listening to worldly music, you need to change that repertoire. Don't underestimate. Don't be naive about worldliness's effect on you, whether it's music, whether it's movies, whether it's, um, you know, friends that you have that listen to music, worldly music, and watch worldly movies and have worldly influences. Um, strive to improve at singing, right? Don't make excuses. Don't just think I'm not the singing type. Remember, it's a commandment. It's not just a gift. The more you practice, the better you're going to get. And, you know, make sure the songs you listen to, that they're doctrinally sound. And the more you listen to them, the more you're going to, to sing them. Uh, and the last thing is, you know, be a singing Christian. Don't be a sinning Christian, right? We all should be singing. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you for uh, your word. Um, thank you for the reminder for us to sing with the right spirit. And I just pray, Lord, that you would um, help us um, as, as a new church. Many of us are, you know, not in singing churches. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to improve in our singing. Lord, uh, help us to strive to have a, a voice that is pleasing to you in terms of, you know, we sing loud and we sing with our heart, Lord, and we sing consciously knowing that you're listening to us. So we thank you, Lord. For, for what you do. We thank you that you've given us the ability to sing. A lot of people wish they had a voice that they could sing with. And I, and I, pray, I praise you, Lord, that we are able to sing as a church. So thank you, Lord, for what you do for us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.